Okay, can everyone hear me? So, yeah? Okay. So who knows who this is? Do people in the audience know who this is? Quite a few people. Not everyone. This is not an iOS developers conference. This is a. Uh, this is Craig Federici, and Craig Federici is a, an important person at Apple these days. He's, a, he's an ex executive, top executive at Apple. He's actually uh, the, the, soft, the senior vice president of software engineering. Basically, he's in charge of all software for the Mac and for iOS. And so I think everyone here probably already knew that already, or most, most people. But maybe what you didn't know is that Craig is actually a really good engineer. And he's actually been doing it for a long time. And he was actually, before he was at Apple, he was actually at Next, with Steve Jobs at Next. And he worked on a framework called the Enterprise Objects Framework, um, which is it's basically an ORM. Uh, and it's really the predecessor of, I guess, Core Data, which is what, if you use iOS these days, you know what Core Data is. And he actually developed, in 1995, he develops a class that Core Data people, Core Data developers know really well, and that's the NS Managed Object Context. So he actually came up with the idea for this thing and actually developed the code for it as well. So, um, that was an important, it's an important distinct, important class in Core Data and it's, it, it, it actually quite, makes it quite different from other ORMs, I guess you could say. Um, but 20 years later, now, so he did that in 1995, 20 years later, we've got a different problem, right? We've got, the, we've got a complicating situation. That is, now we have the cloud, we have got multiple devices, multiple stores, and we've got to f f figure out ways of keeping basically two or more managed object contexts in sync, right? Across a very shaky network, um, without, basically without any uh, direct communication lines. And this is a difficult problem, and this is uh, basically what I want to talk about today. So what is my interest in sync? <coughs> I develop an app called uh, Mental Case. It's an app for students. Basically, it's a, a flashcard study app. And I started developing this app in 2006, I think, yeah? Uh, and it was for the Mac, right? So it's a Mac app, 2006. Uh, it started off as a hobby, slowly grew into business. Um, and then the iPhone came along, and then later the iPad, and I developed an iOS app in about 2008, 2009. And it was clear from the start that these two should sync up, right? It would be pretty crazy if you had the Mac app, you made some study cards on the Mac, and it didn't sync up to your iOS device. So right from the beginning, I had sync. But it was kind of that old-fashioned type of sync that you had with iTunes and iPods where, uh, you know, the, the, the iTunes would basically get anything new from the iPod and then replace the stuff on the iPod. And that, that was how I did it, not via USB, but via Wi-Fi connection. So it was a direct type of sync where the two, the two devices were, were talking directly to one another and, and exchanging information. So I've had this all along, right, this, this sync. And um, after a few years, about two or three years ago, I started to see more and more feedback, more and more reviews. Along these lines, you know, what, why is there no cloud sync in this app? You know, why have we, have to, why have we got this, uh, this Wi-Fi sync? You know, why do I have to connect to the same Wi-Fi network? That, that's ridiculous in this day and age. And the perennial, you know, what year is this? Right? So, so in other words, customers uh, started to demand cloud sync. People expected cloud sync. And um, that's been the case for the last few years. And so I started to think about it, and at the time, there was a sort of an, an elephant in the room in terms of sync for core data, and that was Apple's solution, right? Apple had just announced iCloud. And iCloud um, came with a, a core data syncing component, basically. The idea was, with, with very few lines of code, your core data app could sync up across devices. It, was, it sounded great, right? I thought, I'll spend a couple of months on this. I'll have a beautifully sync in cloud app, and, um, and everything will be solved. And of course, I spent about six months on it, and I never got to the point where I was satisfied that I could ship, uh, ship, a, uh, ship the product. And during that time, I actually blogged quite extensively about it. 
uh, there's about five or six blog posts about how core data iCloud sync actually works because Apple has written very little documentation about it. So if you, if you are interested in core data, uh, iCloud core data sync, uh, these blog posts are still pretty useful, even though they're, they're a few years old now. Uh, they do detail, go into quite a lot of detail about how it's working under the covers and what you should change in your code and things like that. But as I said, even with all that, that effort, uh, I never got to the point where I thought this, I can ship this thing to the public. And so um, I did eventually solve the problem, and I'll talk about that a bit later, at least for the time being. Um, so first I want to talk though about sync in general. I want to go back a little bit and say, okay, where are we with, with, with synchronization? And a lot of people would like to think, I think, that we're in, in the, what's, what's known as the ubiquitous era, right? Where your data is everywhere, on every device, it all syncs up beautifully. And for some devices, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, some, some, some apps, that's true. Things that, you know, email, for example, uh, works very well. Twitter. Um, anything that Google makes tends to work really well in terms of synchronization. But for a lot of apps, it's not true at all. And, and, and if, you, if you take a general app, any app in the App Store, and you and you look and see whether it syncs, I think there's a good chance that it doesn't, unless it's a web app or something. And frankly, I think we're in the pre-ubiquitous era at the moment. We're just in, in, in that bit before everything is ubiquitous, and we haven't quite got there yet. And to stop worrying about it will require us to worry a lot about it to begin with, right? Uh, this is a great quote from Ken Arnold that I stole from the Cultured Code uh, blog. And um, it describes a lot of things in, in engineering, but it, I think it really describes sync at the moment, right? For a lot of us, it's a headache. It's something that keeps us awake at night. It has certainly made the last couple of years of my life uh, pretty horrible. <laughs> and I'm not the only one. There are some pretty big names that have been struggling with sync synchronization, cloud synchronization. Um, Cultured Code is quite a well-known name. They make an app called Things. It's a to-do list. Uh, they have blogs about it, and, and, and they... Um, they, they were at least two years over, over schedule with their cloud syncing. They promised it for years and years, and it was just a difficult problem, and every, everything they tried just didn't quite work the way they expected, and eventually they did come up with a solution, but it was, it was a long time coming. Bare Bones has an app called Yojimbo, um, and they also have, uh, an, uh, have just released Yojimbo 4, but that was, again, more than a year over schedule, and the reason? They tried to use iCloud Core Data Sync. And they didn't get it working, same, same as, as, as me. And Black Pixel, a big name in iOS development these days, um, they still haven't shipped a version of NetNewsWire with a, a sync option, uh, which they've been promising for a long time. So, and they also were trying to use Core Data, iCloud. So, a lot of people having trouble. A lot of people having trouble with this, uh, this problem. So let's have a look. So just say you've got an app, and you and, and it's a core data app, and for iOS, and you want to have this thing sync up. What are, what are your options uh, as of today? Well, you can write a complete web app, right? You can write uh, basically a, a server, a smart server. Let's call it call it a smart server, um, which you know it holds all the data in the cloud, and that your clients talk to. Um, the sort of technologies you can use there, you know, just any server-side technology, PHP, Java, Rails, Django, Node.js, Google App Engine, take your pick. There's a lot of technologies there you can use. Now, this is a perfectly legitimate solution. Uh, plenty of companies go this route. There are plenty of pros as well. But the, a very good thing in terms of sync is that it's a cent you've got a central truth, okay? So... So if uh, it's very unlikely that your client apps will get out of sync, they can always just say, okay, server, tell me what the latest data is. And it, will, and it means that you're very unlikely to ever get really far out of sync. You can always, it's stabilizing. So that central truth is important. It's cross-platform. If you're writing an Android app and you're writing an iOS app and also a web, web app, then you can, you can you, this is a perfect way to solve that problem, right? And there's no lock-in. You can take your Rails app off of, Amazon and put it on Rackspace if you're not happy with Amazon, right? So there's no, there's no real locking. You're not, you're not forced to stay with a, a particular company or provider. There are a few cons. Uh, 
and this is more for, I guess, smaller, smaller companies. Um, it can be reasonably expensive. It depends on your app, of course, but you have to host everyone's data, right? And if, you've got, if your app happens to be an app that uses quite a bit of data, um, you're going to be hosting a lot of data. Every, every, every single user is going to have their data in your, in your account. And there's also some duplicated effort. There's a good chance that you'll be an iOS developer. If you're an iOS developer, there's a good chance you're not that good at Rails or you're not a web developer as well. There are not that many people that can do both really well. So uh, you're probably going to need to be in a small team at least. You can't, probably can't do that on your own. Okay, so say so you don't want to you don't want to go that route. You don't want to go the route of a complete web app. Well, there's, these days you've got something that's sort of in between. Uh, this is what I call a restful store or a structured store. The sort of services I'm talking about: Pass.com, um, Azure, Win, uh, Microsoft's solution for mobile services. Uh, Dropbox have just released a new API called the, the Data Store API, and that is uh, basically this, a RESTful store, uh, just a structured store of data. There are a few smaller ones. Wasabi Sync is a core data only uh, solution. Simperium from the people that make SimpleNote, that's a, a core data, also has a core data aspect. And Helios is from uh, Heroku. And that allows you to use Heroku as your mobile backend. So these are all solutions uh, that, that sort of simplify, uh, you know, that, that server component. It just, just basically puts a store in the, in the cloud and you can just write things to the store. So it's not a particularly intelligent uh, server. It's, it's kind of just a simple server. And there are pros and cons of this, right? So you've still got your central truth. That's, that's, that's useful. Uh, the server is really simple, so you, anyone can do it. You don't have to be an expert web developer, and it should scale as well. And, uh, you know, you haven't got this duplicated effort of having to be a Ruby on Rails developer as well as an iOS developer. Still kind of expensive. You have to st store all that data. You still have to store that data. You've, you've, you've got a, a bit of a vendor lock-in here because it's very difficult to move from one to another. If you've, if you've committed to Azure, they've got a different API to, a, to another company uh, like Dropbox. So you, you'd have to rewrite your code quite a bit to move between them. So you're sort of stuck with whoever you choose. And some of them don't have core data integration, right? So you'd have to bridge with core data. Um, now, the one I want to concentrate on is actually neither of these. It's... It's this one here, uh, file syncing services. Okay, these we're, we're all familiar with file syncing services. I think um, the type of service I'm talking about here is iCloud, Dropbox. There's one from Omni Group called Omnipresence. Uh, Google Drive, Amazon Cloud Drive. Everyone's got one of these, right? Microsoft Cloud, uh, SkyDrive, and even BitTorrent do it these days, right? BitTorrent allow you to sync up a folder. Anything you put in the folder will go through the BitTorrent network to your other devices. So these things are everywhere. Everyone's got one of these. Um, you know, it's, 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 I think we all know how they work. You put stuff in one folder and it ends up uh, crossing, crossing through the server to the other folder on the other device. It's very simple. Basically, you're just sending data back and forth. And so it's, it's actually the most simple sort of server you can think of. So the pros, these are different pros, I guess, to the others. Pro, one pro for a developer like me, uh, just a small company, is that these things are effectively, for me, free, right? The, the user or the, develop, the consumer um, might end up paying Dropbox for the service or, or Apple, but I don't have to process any, any fees or anything to, to provide syncing, right? So that's, that, for me, is an, a bit of an advantage. I don't have to host anyone's data. It's hosted by Apple or Dropbox or Microsoft or whoever's providing the service. There's no real lock-in because these things just sync up folders of, the, of, of files. So, so it's, it'd be pretty easy to move from, from Dropbox to iCloud or, or whatever. And there's no server-side code at all. This, the, the server is just shifting around, around uh, data. Now, there are some cons, of course, as well. Uh, there is no central truth anymore, right? So no, there's no way, you can't talk to any server and say, okay, tell me at this point in time what the, the current files are, right? You can't do that. You can look locally and say, okay, I've got these files, but I don't know locally, I don't know what's happening on other devices, 
right? So it, I might have a I have an incomplete picture of all the data. And that means there's a big risk of divergence. If you go this way, uh, you have to be very careful how you process the data. Um, otherwise, you'll get small changes on each device and they'll diverge. And that's, that's bad when you're syncing, right? And there's no well-established framework in terms of syncing core data for doing this. There are a few options. I'll talk about those. But I would say none of them really are well-established and, and uh, solve the problem well. Now, what I want to do is I want to say uh, these file syncing services, I want you to stop thinking of them as file syncing services and think of them as peer-to-peer -peer networks and actually peer-to-peer -peer communications devices, right? Communications networks. And that's the way we're going to think about it from here on in. Think about it as uh, this phone wanting to send the Mac a message and sends a message to the Mac in the form of a file that it puts in its folder. And the Mac wants to send something back, it sends a file, it puts a file in as a message. So think of it in that way, it's probably the best way to think of it from here on in. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, so we want to use these file syncing services to sync up core data, right? But core data uses a, a database, right? It's, it's basically a SQLite database underneath. And this is a, a tricky problem, actually, to... Um, sync up databases for your files or for your peer-to-peer -peer network. The first thing you, you're probably thinking is, oh, I'll, I just put the database into Dropbox, right? Problem solved, right? And unfortunately, this is a, a, a square peg round hole situation. You can't actually really do that and get away with it for very long. You're very likely to get some sort of data corruption that, you know, a, a database will write over uh, your database while you're using the app, or you're going to just simply lose data, that there's no merging of the data, that the database will come in and replace any changes you've just made. So this is really a bad way to, to, to approach the situation. You can't just take your database and, and put it into Dropbox or into iCloud. What you have to do, and all the solutions that I've seen basically handle it this way, is to split your database into the transaction logs or the deltas um, that make up that database. So imagine this, this cup here is a database. It's made up of matches in this case. And each match represents a little operation on the database uh, that builds up the, the, the cup. So an, an update or an insertion or a deletion, right? Just like on a, you know, a standard database. <laughs> what we do is we take the database and we split it into these matches. We split it. We decompose it into all the changes that went into building the database, all the deltas or transactions that did that. And so what are these, these matches that I'm talking about? Just to give you a more concrete idea of what they are. Um, here's some, some JSON that represents maybe, could represent one of these, these changes in, in a movie app. So we're writing an app for movies. The entity here is called movie. Uh, it's got a global ID, so we can recognize it on all the devices as the same object. It's got a type. In this case, it's an insertion. There could also be an update or a deletion, of course. And then we've got a bunch of properties. The name of the movie, in this case, Twister. Uh, the cast would probably be a relationship to a bunch of actors, so we've got some actor IDs there, right? So this is the, this is the idea of, um, of these deltas. And what we do is we send these deltas, we put them in a file, or multiple files, they go across to the other device, and then we rebuild our database with these deltas. Right? So we replay them and build up a clone of the database on the other machine. Okay? So this is how, how you do it, how you could do it with, uh, with, with files, syncing your databases with files. Now, as I said, there are actually a couple of solutions for this already, and I've mentioned one of them already. That is Apple's solution, iCloud Core Data Sync. It does exactly what I just described, right? It's breaking things into transactions, sending them across, and then rebuilding the database. But as I also mentioned, there's some problems with iCloud Core Data, and pe plenty of people have been having trouble with it. It was, for the first two years at least, uh, very buggy. 
um, which is a real problem when you're talking about data. It's not, it's not a glitch in the user, user interface which you can sort of work around. This is people's data and, and, and when, when they lose data, people get angry, right? So it's, it's something you really, it's, it's not something you want to have bugs in, something that deals with data. So it was buggy and that was a, that was a big problem. But there are other problems, and some of them are really unavoidable. Uh, it's a black box, right? It's proprietary, proprietary software. Uh, it's Apple software. You can't see what they're doing. They don't tell you what they're doing. They don't tell you how it works, how it's supposed to work, what to expect. They don't tell you any of that, right? So you're guessing all the time as to whether the behavior is correct or wh how, wh what happens when there's a conflict. It's not, not documented, right? Um, what happens if validation fails? Not documented. Does it call into your code at any point? Not documented, right? None of this was documented. I, I figured that some of them are out, out on my blog. It, it, you can find it on my blog, but it's it's not documented by Apple. They they just say it, you know it works, <laughs> and unfortunately, it's not not usually good enough. The fact that it's a black box makes it very difficult to test. You can't. Uh, Basically, testing involves two devices and then waiting for things to transfer. And this makes your, your debug cycles very long, right? You make a change on one device, you wait for a few minutes. iCloud transfers to another device and then you see what happens and, and then you try to reproduce that. So your, your debug cycle is minutes long if you're lucky. If you throw too much data at iCloud, it'll actually throttle back your transfers and you can forget it for the rest of the day. You can go home because you're not going to get any more syncing done that day. It's a pretty horrible experience. I've never had such a horrible debug experience. Now, some of these things, yearly release schedules. So, Apple, if Apple f do find a bug, and they do fix these bugs, of course, um, they're stuck on a yearly release schedule most of the time. They, you know, they've got to wait for the next OS upgrade. Um, they sometimes are allowed to issue a, a, a very important fix in, a, in, a, in an inter intermediate release, but that's quite actually pretty hard. Uh, I've talked to people in Apple and that's actually not easy to do. You have to convince people that it's really that important to put in a, you know, a, a 7.1 or whatever. Um, so actually, usually you're waiting for a year. If there is a bug, you're waiting for a year to, to see that fixed. And of course, there's lock-in. None of this is documented. It's not open source. Uh, if you decide you're not happy with iCloud, the iCloud solution, you, you're going to have to rewrite your code completely because you, you can't use any of it. It only works with Apple's iCloud um, backend, basically. So if you decide I want to use Dropbox, uh, too bad. Now, there's one more problem with iCloud core data, and that's again, something that Apple can't really control, that is, when a company like Apple or Google, one of these big companies, they move into a space, like in this case, syncing up core data databases, they create a vacuum, right? Because no one is going to compete with that. No one is going to try to compete with Apple uh, doing a solution for syncing core data, right? So. When Apple issue, it, when Apple came with this solution, they have to get it. They have to get it completely right. Um, if they don't do that, we've got a problem because there's no one else is going to do an open source project to solve the problem or or make a competing commercial offering or anything like that. So that's actually the situation we've been in for about two or three years. That nobody has come up with anything uh, new. There is one other framework. I just said that we did, we don't have anything new. That's still true. There is one other framework you can try, and that is an open source framework. The reason that we've got this framework is simply that it was written before iCloud was announced. Okay, I'm sure if, if iCloud had been announced before uh, they started, they would have stopped immediately. It's called TICDS. It stands for Tim Isted Core Data Sync. Uh, Tim's the guy that wrote it. It's an open source project, uh, MIT license, um, first developed by Tim Estet. It's these days it's maintained by No Thirst Software. No Thirst are the, the guys that write uh, this, this Moneywell product, product you might have heard of. Um, they're, they're, the, uh, the owner of the company is, is Kevin Hochter, and he's often on, uh, on podcasts and things as well. 
Uh, this, this has support from both iCloud and Dropbox as backends, um, and it is actually sh out there shipping. It ships in my app. Uh, this is what I eventually used to ship my app, Mental Case, and also in Kevin Hochter's app, MoneyWell. So it is actually in the wild. But it's not all roses here either. The creator, Tim Istead, is no longer uh, involved. He works now for Apple. He's not allowed to contribute. So that's a pretty serious problem already right there. Um, the code was, as I said, written before iCloud was around. It's probably four or five years old. Some of the Objective-C uh, is old. Um, some of the design decisions, you know, because it was a sort of pioneering work, some of the decisions probably could have been made better now, um, but with hindsight, the benefit of hindsight. But um, so yeah, the design it, it, it has a few problems. One of the problems is, for example, that it uploads a complete copy of your store uh, for every single device, right? So, so if you've got three devices syncing, it's uploading three complete copies of your store, uh, and that could be quite a bit of data depending on your app. It can be quite slow, uh, it uses core data internally, which is okay, but it's not using it very efficiently. It's doing single object fetches and things like that. And the worst thing is that there's no, there's no real guarantee that your stores will stay in sync. The, the algorithm used is not, is not quite sophisticated enough to guarantee, make that guarantee. So in, various, in, in, in certain circumstances, it's possible that things will get out of sync, and that's not a good thing. So that's where we're at the moment. We've got two solutions, uh, iCloud and TICDS, and neither of them are particularly uh, inviting, I would say. So where do we go from here? Well, uh, I w sort of hoped for a while that someone else would do uh, a library, uh, like Black Pixel. Black Pixel were complaining, so I thought maybe they'll do something. And I've waited quite a while, and uh, I decided early in the year that, I, uh, that no one else was going to fix this problem. Um, so I would have to go into the vacuum <laughs> of, uh, of Apple, Apple space and uh, yeah, contribute something. So I've got a little bit of history with open source. I, I founded this open source project called Plot, which is uh, a plotting framework for iOS. And that's still going quite well. I'm not that involved these days, but it's uh, still actively developed. So I want to today introduce you to a new, a new open source project um, for solving this problem, uh, which I call en Ensembles. And it's short for Core Data Ensembles. It's only for Core Data. It's, M it's an M MIT license, uh, open source framework. Possibly later I'll add commercial licenses with, uh, with better, with, you know, increased functionality and source code and things like extra source code and things. But for now, it's just open source. And it will, there will always be an open source component. Um, the idea, of course, is to sync core data SQLite stores. And it should work on Mac and iOS. And the most important uh, concept in this framework is the idea of a persistent store ensemble. If you know core data, you've heard of a persistent store. And the idea is to add one more concept to that, and that is a persistent store ensemble, which couples together persistent stores. And those persistent stores could be on different devices, but they could also be on the same devices. No, they can be any stores, right? Uh, there's no requirement that they be on different devices or anything like that. So it's a coupling mechanism, basically, and that's, that's the component that I'm, I'm trying to write. So I had a few design restraint constraints I set on myself effectively when I started doing this. In fact, I started in April. It's just, I've just been doing it in my spare time, so I haven't been doing it full time. And I want to go through a few of those design constraints first. The first was that it should be non-invasive. What I mean by that is you shouldn't have to modify your model. You shouldn't have to subclass NS managed object context. You shouldn't have to subclass NS managed object. You shouldn't have to change your object, your stack at all, really. Right, your, your core data stack. You shouldn't have to tear it down and build it up. And this is what you have to do with uh, iCloud uh, syncing. You have to make it it's quite invasive. You have to change a lot of things. The idea here was to make it as non-invasive as possible. So it should just latch on to your existing structure and, and just work, hopefully. It should be back-end agnostic. 
It should work with any sort of file transfer mechanism, file syncing. Dropbox, iCloud. Um, if you want to make your own S3 backend, because for maybe you're a company and you're not allowed to make your data public, just write your own S3 backend. It's not a big deal. It's a couple of hundred lines at most of code. Uh, Omnipresence, a new one from Omnigroup. WebDAV, an older one, but still around, right? FTP, any of these should work. I'm not saying I'm going to support them all out of the box, um, but anything that can sh that move around files should work. In fact, it should also work with just Wi-Fi syncing, a direct connection with Wi-Fi where you exchange files, just the same way iTunes might do. That should also be possible. It's just another way of syncing up files. And in fact, I've already built in support for a local file system. Right. Now, that, that sounds pretty crazy, right? Why would you sync via the local file system? Why would you want to do that? Well, that makes it much, much more testable, right? Your app and the framework are much, much more testable when you don't have this debug cycle that is minutes long. You can debug in real time, right? You can set up two copies of your app on the one machine. They can sync via the local file system, and you can be testing in real time, right? So this is a big, this was a, a real sticking point for me. All that pain uh, led me to this, and uh, <laughs> it is actually pretty, pretty important. And I wish you could do it with iCloud, for example. Okay, so say you want to add one of these file systems. Uh, what do you have to do? Say you wanted to add an S3 backend, a uh, custom S3 backend. Well, it's basically just a question of, of implementing a bunch of protocol, a bunch of methods. These, these methods look a lot like the methods of NS File Manager. Okay? The, the big distinction, though, is that they're all asynchronous, right? Because we've usually got networking involved. So it's quite, it's quite straightforward. You just implement it for whatever you want to need to do. File exists at path. You need to be able to answer that. And you answer it by calling a completion block. Contents of directory at path completion. Create directory path. So there's a bunch of these. You implement those and you're, you're, back, you're practically done. It's about 200 lines, I think, uh, 100 to 200 lines for, for, you know, like Dropbox or uh, iCloud. I think I did iCloud the other day. It was maybe an hour's work. And it was probably only uh, 200 lines. The other thing is, I said it was testable. It's also tested, right? <laughs> um, I developed the whole thing with, with unit testing. So I, right from the, well, not actually from the beginning, I started without it and I realized this is going to get real bad uh, unless I start unit testing. And so since then I've, uh, I've been unit testing the whole way and that's how I've been developing each component basically uh, unit testing as I go. So at the moment there's, there's about three and a half thousand lines of, of uh, unit tests. I want to mention uh, how you go about merging, because merging is actually um, pretty tricky in a, in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer situation like this. Um, so let's let's treat the first let's first treat the, the centralized case. Okay, so you've got you've got a central server somewhere, right? And you can lock that server. So one client talks to the server each time. So you've got a central truth, right? This is the, the case most people are dealing with. So what happens then? You've got Say you've got uh, a device one and a device two, and they're doing saves. And each block here is all the changes in one save. Okay? So you can see device one's done three save operations. Device two has done two. And um, time is going up. So we're going to make a new save on each device. And these are going to be concurrent. They happen basically the same time, right? These are two new saves, concurrent changes. And imagine now that both of these find their way through the, uh, the, the, net the network and they're both now on device one. And device one now has to look at these new changes and, and decide what to do with them. What, what is a conflict, for example? What is in conflict? What has changed? And it will it, it can say, okay, what, what do I need to consider? I need to consider what I've done since the last merge and what the other system's done since the last merge. In other words, just the new stuff. I just need to look at the new blocks and I need to see which ones are in conflict and fix them. In a, in a, in a term, deterministic way, right? This is a standard procedure. This is a, the, the way that, for example, TICDS works. It works great as long as you've got a centralized locking server, right? Let's take the decentralized case. Now things are a, a bit more tricky 
we've got different states on different devices, right? So now, device one is on the left here, and device one has got all of the data, and device two is missing a block. It's missing that third block from device one, right? It's maybe still in transit. It's on the server, it's still coming over. It hasn't arrived yet. And they both do the same save they did before, right? Device one does a save, device two does a save, concurrently, same time. Devices two, device two's uh, block finds its way to device one. Now device one is ready to, see, to do a merge, okay? Device one looks at what it's got. Now, what is it going to have to include in this merge? Which blocks, right? It looks like it's the same situation we had before. It looks like, it looks like the same situation, but is it the same situation, right? Can it just take those new two blocks and say, we're gonna merge those two? Well, no, it has to actually take those blocks, those three blocks. And the reason is that this second block, this block from device two has never been compared with the block from the third block from device one, right? So you actually have to include some old data in, in, the, in the comparison. So this is, to do this, we use something called a vector clock. Uh, you have to basically snapshot the whole system every time you do a save so that later on you can, you can rebuild that state and figure out, okay, this one was concurrent with this one. You can figure out what has to be included in the, in the merge. Right? So it's actually a, a step more difficult than a standard syncing server. I should say I got a lot of ideas for this from um, this great blog post from, uh, from uh, Milan Jimerov from, from Clear. He, he, they write this great app called Clear to-do list uh, app that's very popular. And they did this great blog post about how they do uh, syncing with Clear. And this gave me a lot of ideas about these vector clocks and a lot of pointers to, to where to learn more. Um, because I'd actually never worked in that sort of stuff before. So yeah, uh, big thanks for, for that. And that's a great blog post if you're interested in, uh, in how to do these decentralized um, concurrency, basically. Okay, uh, how do you use, what, you know, where, where's some source code? How do you use this? How difficult is it to use this framework? Well, here's a bit of source code to show, uh, to show how you set it up. Um, basically, there are two things you'll need to set up. You'll need a file, what I call a cloud file system. In this case, I'm using iCloud. So I just set up an iCloud uh, file system object. I pass the ubiquity container identifier, which is just standard iCloud uh, identifier. I then make an ensemble. And for that ensemble, I give this file system. I also need to pass in the managed object model and the path of the SQLite store. Right? And there's also an, a, a global identifier there, a, a globally unique identifier for this ensemble. I set the delegate. Now, um, we've, that's all the setup you need, basically. Now, the, now, the, now the, the, the ensemble can be in a couple of different states. The, when, it, when you first make it, and you haven't done anything, it's in an un, what I call a deleached state, right? So it's not leached to the other stores. So you have to. So you can ask the ensemble, are you leached? If you're not leached, okay, start the leaching process. And you have to do this once, right? The first time that you start syncing. And this will set up a bunch of uh, local files, do some stuff on the server, if there's a server or whatever. Um, basically, it's the initialization of the whole thing. Um, and later on, once you already are leached, all you have to do to do a merge is just called merge with completion, right? And that will do. That will look at the new stuff, merge it together, and update your database. That's effectively the synchronization method. The only other thing you might want to consider are these two methods here. These are these are uh, delegate methods. Um, whenever you have a background save of a managed object context with core data, you have to merge those those results. So you have to call this to make sure that your managed object context knows about those new changes. So yeah, you, you wanna, you'll definitely want to do this one, right? And this one's optional. This one allows you to provide global identifiers for objects. And effectively, that means that the framework can automatically import your, your library without you doing anything, um, as long as it's got its global IDs. That's it. That's all the code. That's 20 lines of code, and you've got a syncing app.
right? That's iCloud syncing done. Right? It's that easy, really. So at the current status, we've got about 6,000 lines of, uh, of pretty dense framework code, 3,500 lines of unit tests. Um, so it's about 10,000 lines, I guess, all together. Um, I only got the first full sync done about a week ago, so it's pretty new. Right? I was really pushing to hit this uh, deadline. Uh, but I had lots of components, but they weren't quite uh, working together. But, but it's, it's done. At least uh, the first stage is done. It's syncing, at least. So where's the code? Well, I actually gave a talk similar to this about a month ago, and at that, and, and at that time, I just had to say, well, this is vaporware. Um, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> But today, I actually do have, uh, it's actually an important day, <coughs> right? Um, because I actually do have the code now. And so what I'd like to do is if I have network, <laughs> I would like to try to push this to GitHub. So what is it? Git push. Oh. Uh, yeah, origin, master, right? Origin. Master. Do do I need any? Oh, you got it. Okay, so it's done. <laughs> hey. Is that where that hitch, pretty much. So there it is. Go get it. I know you guys love QR codes. <laughs> now, for the old-fashioned in the audience, there's a, a URL. So if you're interested, uh, that should be where it is now, unless I accidentally pushed it somewhere entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my username, Drew McCormack at GitHub Ensemble. Um, yeah, so that's that's actually all I've got to talk about. Uh, this is my take-home message. It's it's still quite early days, really, for decentralized database syncing. It's, it's, it's a difficult problem. There are a few solutions already out there, iCloud from Apple uh, and TICDS, uh, but neither are really uh, satisfactory, in my opinion. Um, TICDS is probably the best option you've got at the moment, um, and I'm hoping that the Cordata Ensembles will be the next step. Basically, learning. I, I learned a lot of things from TICDS, I learned a lot of things from Apple's solution, and I've tried to get the best things from both and, and, and fix things that I thought weren't right. And hopefully that's the next step, core data ensemble. So check that out if you're interested. And some attributions, that's all. So thanks a lot. Uh, what about security issues with syncing services? Government looking over your shoulder, only suitable for non-sensitive data. <laughs> Someone from the NSA is here, right? <laughs> no, uh, that's a good question. And as I said, this whole thing is, uh, is back-end agnostic, right? So you can write a secure server as you like. In fact, it would be very easy, I was just thinking about this exact point this morning, it would be very easy to make it, use the decorator design pattern, if, every, if you, like, you guys should all know that one, um, to take, say, iCloud's uh, um, file system and, and simply wrap it in uh, an encryption system that takes the file, encrypts it before putting it in iCloud. That, that should be literally 50 lines of code. It depends on your encryption system, maybe, but if you're just calling out to a library or something, it should be very easy to do that. So you can add any encryption you like to the data. It doesn't care about that. As long as it comes back into the library, when it reads it back in, it comes back in unencrypted, of course, right? You've, it's, it's, it's still going to be core data. So, um, yeah, so uh, I don't see really any problem. If you want to encrypt, that's, that's the whole point, really. Uh, if you want to do a custom back end, you want your own server, you want your own encryption, whatever, it should be very easy to do with, uh, with this. <coughs> and you can't do that with iCloud, right? It's just not, that's another problem with iCloud. You, you don't have that option. So uh, that was the uh, first question. Could we switch off the very cold air conditioning? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alternatives to core data, SQLite. Yeah, well, 
of course, yeah, I've got a Cordata app, so I wanted to write, I wanted something for Cordata. And I think there's a, there is an advantage to using uh, Cordata, and that is, even if you don't like everything about Cordata, you think it's a bit slow or whatever, there's an advantage to all, to people working on the same thing, right? I can write a syncing framework for core data, and you can use the syncing framework for core data. Whereas for other solutions, if you're going to make your own stuff, your own uh, model layer on, on SQLite, for example, which a lot of people do, I think, <coughs> makes their own version of core data, then you're going to have to write the syncing yourself as well, right? So there's an advantage to being together on, you know, having a standard. In this case, on iOS, I think core data is a good reasonable standard because it's Apple's solution. Um, so yeah, of course you could take all the, the things that I've put into this framework and, and apply them to a syncing framework for SQLite. And there is actually, there is actually one, uh, there is actually a SQLite, um, a company that does SQLite syncing. Uh, anyone know the, the name? No? They, oh, uh, I, I heard about them a few months ago and they, they look like they're good, but they're, they're one company, right? So you have to trust that, that company. Um, but yeah, so the same, the same techniques that I used are basically general database techniques and you could apply the same things to a SQLite syncing framework if you wanted to do that. Um, what algorithms and data structures are, are you using for syncing? I use core data internally. It, that's because I know it and I figure people that come to it will also know it, right? If people that want to look into the code probably know core data because they're using core data, right? So internally I use core data. Um, in terms of algorithms, well, I mentioned that briefly, uh, that the main problem with the algorithms is just figuring out this problem of um, causality, right? Things that happen concurrently. Uh, you know, what's first when two things happen almost at the same time? You can take a timestamp, but do you trust the timestamp? So I don't, I don't trust the timestamp, that's the answer to that. I use a vector clock to ensure that things on every device happen in exactly the same order, right? That's important. And I don't trust timestamps. The timestamps are used to, for sorting certain things, but they're, 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 not, um, they're not the main sorting mechanism. I, I use a different system for that, which is taken from uh, distributed systems computer science. So it's called a vector clock, uh, basically. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, area of uh, computer science that I've never heard of, to be honest. But yeah, figuring out what's, what came first is, is, a, is a tricky thing to do. Um, how, does your, how does your library handle changes made offline? Perfectly fine. There's no server here, right? It's, it's just, it will save changes locally, and then it will try to contact your cloud syncing service. And if your cloud syncing service is not contactable, it'll just have an error, and next time it'll try again. Right, so just cache, basically cache locally the, the changes, and then when it does get a connection, it will load them up. So yeah, there's no problem with offline. That's, that's, uh, that's it. Very important, of course, right? Um, one more, I think, is there? How, how does your library handle changes made offline? Same question. Yeah. <laughs> exactly the same as a minute ago. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's that's it. Yeah. So any more questions? I always have questions. Um, Cocoa pods. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you. I thought I might get that question after this this morning's uh, talk. Yeah. No. Uh, I'm going to definitely add that. It just this is so fresh. It's uh, it's on Git, and that's about it. <laughs> if you want to go through it with me at some point. Yeah, it should be too. I, I assume it's not that difficult, right? You just write a spec or something, and yeah, yeah. I've used Cocoa Pods a bit as a user, but I've never actually made a, a pod. Uh, so, and for the encryption part, we've got the next talk, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someone should be busy on the uh, file system stuff right now. Yeah, <laughs> we've got time for a last question, I think. Oh, we could end this here. So remember to vote. And uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs>